Welcome to our first education discussion for kinship families. My name is Paula Gilhooley and I'm the education advisor in Scotland for the Adoption UK organisation. Um, I'm an adoptive parent and I'm also a support for learning teacher. I've worked in education for over 20 years in different roles, um, covering secondary, primary and in international schools as well. Each month, we have a, an education discussion that centres around a theme, and these discussions are for kinship families. This is the presentation that was given during our education discussion on accessing support at primary school. So during the short presentation, we're going to have a look at common problems in schools, additional supports, how we begin accessing supports, and then on the screen, you'll see where we, we stopped to have a discussion about some of these things. And then we're going to look at what, what we can do when problems continue. OK, I thought we'd start with a quick look at some of the problems we face in school. Schools group children chronologically, and there's usually a wide range of ability in any one class. Ages can span almost 18 months. Curriculum for excellence and the measuring of attainment means that children are often compared with peers. And I understand why we do this, but it also frustrates me as a parent and a support for learning teacher. Neurodiverse brains work differently and they don't naturally survive in a traditional classroom. They require a more flexible approach and can benefit from the supports that we'll talk about in a wee bit. But they can also need more time for a variety of reasons. A child who's got immature social skills might not be interested in the playground games or chat that their peers have when they go out to play. And this can be one of the, the biggest issues, I think, that some of our children face. Um, sometimes children don't fully appreciate the themes that are being taught in a class topic just because their maturity level's not quite there yet. Um, and I think sometimes teachers, as teachers, we can be at fault a little bit for the way that we present that because we because we sometimes cater to the majority of the class. Um, and what we really need to be doing is thinking, that's okay if a child is not there yet, because that's where they are in their development level. We just need to accept it and look for ways to accommodate that and perhaps open up topics for children. And children can take longer to achieve emotional regulation than peers. And again, particularly where there's a neurodevelopmental condition or a threat response is overstimulated. We need every child to be able to flourish, including those whose personal and social, personal and emotional development needs extra time. Um, our schools are definitely stronger when every child has what they need to thrive and to be healthy. So we need to work together to make that happen. And we know that when teachers work with families, then children are well supported and they thrive in school. So when children and families get the support they need at the right time, they grow stronger. But we also know that there's a gap here and that lots of families don't feel supported. When staff lack knowledge of trauma or they lack knowledge of FASD and they're not open to learning from families, then children's progress suffer. Um, the good news is that there are lots of people and organisations working to improve this and it is a national priority and there are programmes and training taking place behind the scenes. And a change on that scale takes time to embed. Um, another thing to think about is that school systems were built with the masses in mind, and we're kind of still working with that legacy. So some of us are even still working in Victorian buildings. Um, neurotypical learners are the majority, and so the curriculum does centre on this, but it is changing. And there are more and more children coming through with neurodiverse profiles, there are young people coming through who are passionate about change. They are autistic, care experienced or um, LGBTQ young people who are speaking out about what does and doesn't work in the school environment. And they're creating a, an environment that is better for young people today. But when a school doesn't make room for neurodiversity, then that's where a young person is struggling to be their authentic self and you might see that coke can effect at home. All children need to feel safe, cared for, and have a sense of belonging to be in the optimum place for learning. And when they don't 
feel these things and instead feel under threat, they will mask their behaviour by acting out or complying. And sometimes children's behaviour becomes the focus of attention rather than their learning progress. And if a child is struggling to cope with a cognitive learning load in class and they become overwhelmed, withdrawn or act out, and if this is your child, then the first point of call would be to ask someone like me, to ask a support for learning teacher, to take a closer look at what's going on. And I probably don't need to tell you what the problems are with the system. You might be seeing those up close. The ESN legislation requires schools to make reasonable adjustments for pupils with additional support needs. But the law doesn't say how much or what type of support learners should get. Instead, it says the support must be adequate and efficient and based on individual needs. But what reasonable adjustments and adequate and efficient means is debatable. And it is possible that families see this differently to teachers. Um, some people might think that additional support means that a child has got full time one to one support assistant. But it really covers anything that we do to help a child who needs extra support with their learning. It can be something that is a one off thing that happens or it can be something that you do regularly. It really does cover a lot of different things. So in terms of learning and teaching, it might be something like a teacher is using a particular story to try to teach a concept with a child. We often use things called social stories. Um, it might be that you're using a specific reading scheme for dyslexic learners or that you've introduced a programme like Zones of Regulation all the way through the school to support children's emotional regulation. It might be, um, it might be being mindful of language um, for you to accommodate literal thinkers. It might be being mindful of the language you use to accommodate those pupils who process language quite literally. So we would avoid metaphors. It might just be giving extra time. It might be buddying a child up with someone else so that another another peer can provide some support. It might be um, organising your lessons with pairs or it might be doing some individual work or small group reinforcement. Really does cover a lot of different things. It might be support from other people. So you might ask an educational psychologist to come and provide a little bit of advice for school staff. Um, it might be the educational psychologist does an observation and then, and then reports back or the educational psychologist advises at a child planning meeting. It might be that the speech and language therapist um, suggests some support strategies that could be introduced in school. And very often these might be things like breaking down the task into smaller chunks using visuals. Um, it might be that a support for learning teacher but a pupil support assistant works with a small number um, of children, um, perhaps, you know, a, a special group that's focusing on um, literacy, for example. Or it might be that, that somebody works one to one with a child for a period of time. It can even mean um, that teachers work together. So a support for learning teacher might go in and work with the class teacher so that there are two teachers um, teaching the class at a particular point. Um, and it can also mean accessing people from partner organisations who come in and support within school. And I'll come back to that in a wee while. And then in terms of resources, it might be that you've used a particular tablet um, or you've given out coloured overlays um, to help children who have visual stress or you've provided headphones or ear defenders. Um, even things like pencil, <laughs> pencil tights, pencil grips, sloping boards, wobble cushions, stools, um, or a quieter space. All of these things are kind of examples of additional support. So it really does cover loads of things. But the thing to bear in mind is, is that the child is being supported. So every child is different and might need different approaches. One dyslexic child doesn't like um, coming out of class and another dyslexic child really loves the one-to-one -one time with someone. So that's really important to find something that works for each child. And also the context is important. The term reasonable, efficient and adequate is likely to vary um, the number of pupils, the types of need, the building and the location might be factors. Staff absence is a factor too. In my case, um, physical space is a, a particular resource issue for us when it comes to providing quieter spaces for pupils. The old Victorian building doesn't really lend itself to small breakout spaces. 
but we have to think really creatively about how we can how we can manage that. Um, the first thing to do if you do have a problem is talk with the class teacher. Most needs are supported by the class teacher. And if the problem can't be resolved there, um, then ask to speak to the support for learning teacher um, or the deputy head teacher. And it might be that they can resolve something and put support into place for you. Support for learning teachers can take a closer look at learning and suggest the way forward. Um, we know that all children need the same things to, to thrive. They need a stable home, strong support and a steady, loving relationship. And for children who haven't always had that, there is a presumption that they will need additional support, perhaps to achieve the same level of security. So they should be part of the GERFEC process and have regular planning meetings. And by regular, that would depend on the needs of the pupil and the capacity of staff. So regular might be an annual meeting that you would have. Um, you're likely to have more if your child has got complex needs or is in crisis. If you don't have a planning meeting in place, then ask for one. These meetings are formal, they've got minutes and they follow a structure um, to generate a plan. So the structure will cover what the child's strengths are, any concerns you have, what the strategies are and the actions going forward. And the meeting should focus on the child and the child's current situation, whether that situation is at home, um, in school or both. And the meeting should include everybody's views, with the child's views being the most important. And the difficulty for school with these meetings is time. The meetings tend to use up a lot of time and they gather large numbers of people together. So please remember that the educators um, are likely to have multiple meetings in one day with multiple actions to follow up on. And generally there isn't any extra time given to do that. When it's our family, the focus is our child and we might think our ask is a reasonable one, but do try to keep in mind the time that a teacher will need to support your child as well as the rest of the class plus their whole school responsibilities so time will be an issue for them. Many children need additional support at some point of their school journey and this usually involves planning to make sure that the type of support is right and there are lots of different types of support plans. Personal learning planning is for all children and young people regardless of whether or not they have any additional support needs. Different schools will have their own approaches and formats. Pupil progress meetings or parent consultations, sometimes people might call them. Pupil progress meetings should discuss what your child is learning, what evidence of achievements and progress will look like, and the planning for the next steps. And this can help to identify the support needs that your child has. Local authorities also use something called staged intervention to identify the level of support that a child needs. Staged intervention models, they vary from one local authority to another. But generally, there are a few different stages and a child's progress is reviewed regularly and then they might move between those stages if they need more or less support. Very often, they'll need more support. So stage one would be um, would be where support happens in class and it's the class teacher that's managing that. Stage two might be support from somebody else in school, like a support for learning teacher um, or a pupil support assistant. Stage three might be when you've got support from a service outside of education, like a speech and language or educational psychology involved. Stage four might be if there, are, if there is some kind of all alternative provision taking place. Um, perhaps a child has um, an alternative activity going on at, at different parts of the week. Stage five might be ultimately a, a special school place. So there are different levels of support that are available. Um, schools will also be aware of and will use the getting it right for every child approach to make sure that all the people who support your child work together to give you and your child the right help at the right time. And these meetings produce a child's plan and the action points and the targets are built into the minutes. Some schools might have an additional support plan to record the adjustments. So supports and interventions that are needed to help your child progress in school. Sometimes these adjustments are more about being flexible with how teaching occurs and the language used rather than the fact that the child cannot engage in class learning. Um, it, it, so 
um, you might record those things in a plan so that the teacher knows that they have to make adaptations. It's not that the child isn't able to access the, the learning or to be able to reach the same level of achievement as everybody else in class. An individualised education programme is a written document that outlines the steps to be taken to help a child or young person with additional support needs to achieve specific um, learning outcomes. Often this is when a child is at a different level of learning to the rest of the class and requires substantial change to class learning and when specialists may be involved in helping the child to meet learning targets. Um, so for example, it, it might be that you have a child in primary seven who's still working at early level for literacy topics and, and that very big difference in in achievement level. So you would use an IEP when there's a substantial difference between the child and the rest of the class that um, normal differentiation wouldn't accommodate. And again, to put that in context, I work in a school of about 500 children and in that school there would be less than about 10 children who are on an IEP. A coordinated support plan is a statutory plan used to identify and ensure provision of and services for children and young people with complex or multiple additional support needs. And your child might be eligible for a coordinated support plan if their needs have got a significant negative effect on their school education and they are likely to last more than a year or last at least a year. And they need support from a local authority and at least one other non-education service or agency. Um, and there is certainly a recommendation that we look at all care experienced children and ask, do they need a coordinated support plan in place? However, unless you have at least one other non-education service or agency involved, like social work or health, then you are not going to meet the criteria for a CSP. And if you want to know a little bit more about planning formats, then Enquire has got guides on personal learning plannings, IEPs and coordinated support plans. I think this is really important to keep in mind. Some children have been through a lot in their lives. They've got very busy brains and nervous systems. They are progressing through learning and being judged alongside peers who've got no barriers to learning and whose life experiences have been pretty uneventful. Your child might benefit from some flexibility in time scales and approaches. Expectations can remain high and there can still be a positive destination, but that positive destination might be a little bit outside the local authority's time scale. The positive destination has to be in line with, um, with the child's development. And support is available up to the age of 26 for a reason. There is no wrong path. So this is the part in the presentation where we stopped to, to have a little bit of a discussion. This is a checklist that grew out of a session, um, an education discussion session we had with, um, with families. It's pretty much everything that's ever been suggested to me over the years in terms of providing care experienced children with additional support. It's not a toolkit or explanation of why something is important. If you need more information on why and how to do something, then you can check the Let's Learn Together booklet, which is brilliant and still pretty concise. This checklist is for busy teachers. Um, so it's something that as a family, you might want to send into school. If your child has got difficulty with school, and many do, um, then you could have a scan through this list and think about what's already in place in school for your child, which bits, of the checklist do you think had a priority concern for your child? So you could maybe start there and see if there's something that, that you and school could, could put into place right away to support your child. So for example, um, if your child struggles with transition, so things happen between classes or between moving from the class to the playground and back again, then there are some, some supports in that transition section that might be of help. So things like, um, giving the child a job or letting them leave the class early or come back slightly later. So there are just lots of little practical things as well as maybe um, some bigger tasks for, for teachers. Um, and I think, you know, just looking at the screen there, it says understand the triggers, read the child's education file. 
So one of the things we often talk about in education is being trauma informed. Um, and the word trauma masks an awful lot of things, I think. And it's really important that we don't that, that we take the time to unpick what that means for individual people. So if there's something in a child's education file about um, violence, for example, then it might be that when there's loud noises or there's a, a fight in the playground, then that's going to cause a, a particular reaction for the child. So people need to be aware of that in order to be able to put the right supports in place. Perhaps somebody who's teaching your child is unaware of some of the potential triggers. So there's just lots of suggestions in that in that list for you. In terms of how support works in primary school, the number one rule is follow the GERFEC process. Get the planning meeting in place. Get the GERFEC meeting in place and support your child to articulate how they feel and what they need, because the child's views should be central. The second part is a little bit trickier to get right. Often the needs of children don't fit neatly within boxes or systems, and all children need a stable environment, strong support and a steady caring relationship in school. And when we don't provide that, and sometimes even when we do, we can trigger trauma responses. And trauma responses don't fit with social norms. So we need to have schools apply creative thinking and flexibility to solutions. Because the more knowledge of trauma and brain development we have, the more likely we are to make connections between our solutions um, and the science behind it. And the more likely they are to work as well. We know that school staff keep being given the message relationships matter. So we need to stay people focused in our supports. Every child deserves to flourish. And if we get support right and children do well in school, they'll have better mental health and have opportunities to thrive. When we are following the GERFIC process, which is what local authorities should be doing, then we're also following the staged intervention process. This lets us build evidence of our children's needs um, and evidence of where support is or isn't working. And if it isn't working, then we keep moving through that process of stages to get to the right level of support that we need for our child. And if at any point we think that school is failing in their duty to provide adequate support, then there is a process that we can follow for that too. Um, in most cases, the local authority will have the legal responsibility, the, the local authority where you live will have the legal responsibility for making sure your child has got the support that they need. Um, there are some situations where another local authority might be responsible. But most of the day-to-day -day responsibility for arranging and providing for your child's support will be with your child's school or nursery. And if your child needs more or different support than what the school or nursery can provide, then your local authority is responsible for making sure that they get the help that they need. The local authority can ask other services like health or social work for help. By law, education authorities must identify, provide for and review the additional support needs of their pupils. The Education Additional Support for Learning Act sets out the duties of education authorities and the rights of parents, children and young people to additional support for learning. But the law doesn't specify how they do this. Um, what we suggest when you're speaking about your child's needs and problems, what you should do, first of all, is ask for a meeting to address your concerns. But remember, when you're speaking about your child's needs, it can be quite an emotive experience. So my best tip would be to take somebody along with you to meetings and that can help by providing additional support for you. They can be a neutral voice, they can take notes, they can prompt you if you forget something. Um, and they're more likely to, um, to stay neutral. Prepare what you want to say in advance and we've got some various different help sheets that might help you to do that. I don't know if, if some of you have been on our connective parenting course or have come across non-violent resistance approaches. Haim Omar is a proponent of non-violent resistance. And in a book called Courageous Parents, Being a Good Anchor for Your Child, he makes a couple of suggestions about how to work with schools. He suggests being honest with schools and try to avoid um, criticism. And I think I'm learning that sometimes it's quite hard to avoid 
an implication of criticism, even when you're asking for help. Um, you suggest using phrases like, if we do this together, or I know you're trying to help my child. Um, sometimes that's not easy. But if we work together, he suggests remembering to respect the teacher's need to support the whole class. So when you're making suggestions, um, keep that in mind. And you might say, um, I know you've, you, you're you working with the rest of the class. Um, it's important to help my child while, while still helping everybody else in the class. He talks about positive involvement. So at the first pupil progress meeting, you can make clear that you're open to knowing the good and the bad, the positive and the negative about your child. You, you, you're open to receiving everything. Um, and again, I think I mentioned honesty already. Be honest about any problems that you've got. Um, sometimes I think when we are aware of everything that our child is carrying, um, protection can be our first point of call. And when we, when, when we leap to protect our child, maybe the implication is that somebody else is at fault. But if we can try really hard to opt for something neutral, like, you know, we understand that this is difficult and we're doing everything that we can to help. If we're open about what's difficult, then teachers might be willing to open up as well. Lastly, if there are, and, and you know, in any relationship you do, you do fall out, and when we fall out, it can be natural to point the blame at the other side. But if this happens, it's really important that we try to repair that because you and school need to be on the same team for your child in order to get the really, really get the best out of education for your child. So if you fall out with the class teacher, then look to the head teacher to help you repair that or look for an advocacy worker to help you do that or mediation services. Our ultimate aim is to support rather than protect our child. So support means we're helping our child to build their skills, to empower them, to lead as full a life as they can. Support is what's going to help the child to function better in the longer term. If you're being supportive, you're looking for solutions for difficulties. We're not saying that a certain behaviour is OK because it comes from early life experiences. Um, or because we know something is hard for them. We're, we're looking at a particular behaviour and we're saying, right, okay, I see where that's coming from. I know it's hard from you. Let's look at what we can do to try to make it easier for you in the future um, and build your tolerance levels. There are a range of services you can approach outside of school whose insights might provide additional support for you. So there's social work, um, whether it's in the kinship team or a different part of social work that might be able to, to offer you extra support. There are national and local organisations like um, Who Cares Scotland, Children First, Bernardo's, um, or community support programmes like um, MCR Pathways, People Know How, um, who, who can provide extra support. They might, um, they might offer bespoke support programs or offer something like counselling or mentoring um, or, ther or art therapy or something like that. And there's a brilliant link on the kinship.scot website which takes you to services by local authority. And there might be some, some things down there that you can look at. Lastly, um, if you get to the stage where really you are not satisfied with all the support that you've had from school and the local authority, then Enquire is the best place to go for looking at what you're entitled to by law. So um, Enquire have got information on the process of raising concerns with the school. And if you feel school haven't responded to your concerns, then just follow the process outlined by them. Talk to the class teacher, put concerns in writing, speak to the head teacher, contact the local authority um, or look at independent mediation. When you do get in contact with school, do allow time for a response at every stage um, and do think about the, the recommendations of Haim Omar. Local authority websites usually have their policies and procedures on their websites and you can check against these to see if you've got grounds for a complaint. If you cannot reach an agreement with a local authority, you might wish to appeal to the Additional Support Needs Tribunal. The tribunal is an independent and expert body 
that consider certain kinds of appeals and disagreements about additional support for learning. So if you apply for a coordinated support plan and the local authority rejects you, then you might want to take that to the ASN tribunal. Um, if you've been refused a placing request to a special school or a nursery, the ASN tribunal might be able to, to support. The tribunal considers the arguments and the evidence that's put to them and decides what should happen next. And they can either uphold or overturn decisions. It can be really helpful um, for you if you keep evidence along the way. So emails, reports, etc. Um, could be very useful if you think you're going to go to an ASN tribunal. And finally, um, govern law, provide legal representation in appropriate education law cases. You will find lots of information on our websites. If you'd like to book an education consultation with me, you can contact me at paula.gilhooley at adoptionuk.org.uk.